So this is the final lecture for Anthropology 203, Human Evolution, anticipating the future. And this is quite a, a different than previous lectures. We really are going to use the lecture today to sort of pull together some of the threads of our discussion over the quarter and think about what we can do with some of the new ideas and knowledge that we gain through the quarter. If you think back to the very beginning of the class, we talked about some of the goals of anthropology. And there are reasons why anthropology is interested in human evolution. We want to understand our past. We want to understand our origins and where we came from. We want to understand how things have changed through time. And we've seen a lot of this over the quarter. We've seen contemporary evidence of human evolution in terms of genetics and primatology. We've seen material evidence from the earliest humans going back about 100 to 300,000 years ago. And then we saw fossil evidence from the more distant past going all the way back of approximately 5 million years and the existence right, of ancestral hominids to Homo sapiens. But at the very beginning of the quarter, we also said that anthropologists are interested in questions such as, you know, who are we as human beings and how should we live? So anthropology, you're taking it for natural sciences, uh, part of the general education curriculum, but anthropology is also uh, included in the social science general education category, and it's included in the arts and humanities category as, as well. While we've been focused on scientific aspects of anthropology, anthropology, like the humans it tries to understand, is very holistic. It, in, it sort of includes the range of human endeavors. And this idea about how should we live, uh, what should human behavior be like, and so on, is important for anthropology. And it's one, really one of the reasons why we study something like human evolution. So at this point, if we stop the course and we just think about the implications of the discussions that we've been having, well, Homo sapiens are one distinct animal species. We've talked a little bit about human biological diversity, and we can say at this point that it's not racial. Races are a concept that humans have of biological diversity, but in fact, it's inaccurate. When we've been thinking about the integrity of Homo sapiens, we've been thinking about the relationship between Homo sapiens and other species, it's important for us to say there's no evidence in human evolution of subspecies to Homo sapiens today. When we look at the genetic diversity of Homo sapiens, in fact, there's more biological difference within so-called racial groups than there are between one racial group and another. There's simply ideas we have about uh, biological diversity, but they really are, are not um, accurate in terms of human biology. And we have to raise this, right, because racism is a very significant social problem today, not only in the United States, but, but globally. So, when we study human evolution, we get a much better sense of the unitariness of the Homo sapiens, the species itself. We have some sense of the basic human biology, basic human needs, right? And we might, at this point in the quarter, think about, you know, despite having studied that, the huge health inequalities, right? Um, for a place just thinking about here like the United States the huge racial inequalities around things like uh, health care and illness and so on. And so the, these are problems. These are ways that anthropologists would say, we're not living right, right? We're not really taking the lessons of, um, of how we understand human evolution and the development of our species. We're not incorporating this into our social policies as a, as a society. And so anthropologists, when they study human evolution, you had a kind of, I think of it as a sketch, right, of a, of a human evolution area or course of study. But we could also be looking at the way that this inequality developed through time. Uh, so that when we go before the development of agriculture, we have very little evidence for human inequality in the archaeological record. But after the development of agriculture and the development of fixed residential communities, 
urban localities and so on, we begin to see the increase in things like inequality. We begin to see the uh, increasing competition and conflict over resources. And then we see that become racialized, right, as the variety of human populations and their rather simple, uh, some visual differences, things like skin color, something that's just basically melanin's presence in the skin at different layers, something that for us appears to make one human being different than another, where in reality, really, there's no biological difference between somebody having lighter, uh, darker skin color other than where that melanin is, right? Whether it's has a surplus, right? Or a deficit of melanin within the skin layers. So once human populations with these physical differences began to interact in a global kind of world system, uh, we begin to see the use of physical differences to also legitimize things like inequality in access to resources and thus things like inequality in health and inequality in experience of illness. And so anthropologists today, in studying human evolution, we're interested in what can we learn about human inequality and then how can we learn to live with less inequality? How can we learn to tackle right this problem of inequality? And it's just at this point in a human evolution class to make it very clear that there is no biological basis for race, uh, despite what our society and what societies other parts of the round will, will say about it. Mention this idea of 10,000 years ago in uh, human evolution, and it's an important moment uh, because if we're going to think about how to, to live, there's lessons that can be learned from what we see as a change in the archaeological record, right, with the development of, of agriculture. With the advent of agriculture, one of the things that we, we see is an increase in infectious diseases as human populations congregated in, in uh, urban areas and they began to uh, live in larger groups of more dense settlements, we began to see the rise of in infectious disease. Because of the change in dependence on a lower quality food stuff, we began to see nutritional um, issues and the kinds of health um, related concerns that, that come with that. We saw population growth, uh, that agriculture, as it increased the surplus amount of foods that were available to that population, uh, really opened up what we might think of as exponential population growth for human beings. So before agriculture, human beings were very, very small population on the earth. But through agriculture, we've reached where now uh, over 50% of the world's population is urbanized and over 50% of the total land area of the earth is devoted for agricultural purposes. As we talked about, this is raising this issue of environmental degradation, particularly as we then add the industrial revolution and the movement away from animal labor, including human labor, to other forms of energy, particularly fossil fuel energies, and the uh, extractive industries that it's based upon. We've had massive environmental degradation. And so again, if we're learning to, to how should we live, right, from the lessons of human evolution, we need to take the lessons to heart, right, of the past 10,000 years. There is a lot to predict increase of health issues. We're in a pandemic right now global pandemic of infectious disease. Uh, so we can uh, learn from this that we're going to have this continuing to move forward, this problem of global in infections, the continued problem of population growth, and how we maintain equitable distribution of resources across the world's population in a way that reduces things like conflict and, and warfare. And then how we're going to uh, develop and maintain a sustainable relationship to the natural in environment. All of these are very, very pressing problems for us to be considering um, as we finish a class like this, as we move on with the rest of our, our, our lives. Global climate change is a very real issue.
In fact, that's the future that many anthropologists are considering for us today. We, in talking about the development of agriculture, we talked about a geological epoch known as the Holocene. And this was, as we came out of the Miocene and we had a cooling into the Holocene, uh, that process uh, led to the urban agricultural like human uh, behavior, human way of life that we, we have today with the kinds of population increase and conflict and so on. Well, anthropologists would say that in fact, really with the development of industrialization and the use of fossil fuels, that we've left the Holocene for something that we would call the Anthropocene, when the human species becomes a geological force on the earth. Uh, so we're not just a, you know, a small species of, uh, let's say, 10 to 20,000 members that have a local impact right, on an environment. Now, with the population increase today uh, throughout the, the world, humans are not just modifying the local env environment, but they have modified the global biosphere and they are modifying the development of geological strata in a very distinctive way. So that, let's say, five million years from now, the, the archaeological record will be very, very clear about the rapid transformation of the environment that we saw. Uh, this is something, of course, that our society is talking about today uh, with the rises of extreme weather events, the uh, beginning of fire seasons earlier and extending later into the year. We had the massive fires, right, in the last few years in, in California. And so we are facing new challenges as a species. We are facing new adaptive and selective pressures we have to slow global warming. We really need to bring our uh, carbon dioxide and other warming gases, we need to slow their um, release into the environment. We need to modify human behavior on a global scale. These are huge challenges and huge problems that we're, we're facing, but there's hope it, it can be done. It's just that um, it's gonna take knowledge. It's going to take insight into this issue. And it's going to take a lot of dedication to the problem. And this is where I think the ideas of sort of the last 10,000 years and this new Anthropocene that we're facing, the issues of race and racism are very important, right? We need a unified global effort. And at this point, we, we're not unified as a species globally. We are incredibly divided across the globe with a, uh, an archaic system of nation states and boundaries and uh, local level, state level governments that are, as we've seen, simply incapable of functioning on a global level. So we do have, when we look at human evolution also, some insight into what is really needed in terms of moving forward, this united global effort that transcends existing you know, social, ethnic, political, um, divides. So to conclude here, if we're going to try to take some big lessons, right, from a class like this, the kinds of lessons that aren't uh, memorized details, memorized facts, right, of, of human evolution, but the big takeaway kinds of lessons, a unified human species, Homo sapiens, a very big picture of our evolution and development that's cautionary and is giving us warning signs uh, of things like our population growth and its impact both on the natural world, but also our relationships with one another in terms of things like inequality, the ways that the massive um, weather events that we've seen, the big hurricanes in places like Texas and, and Florida and so on, disproportionately affect people of color and people of lower socioeconomic orders the evidence is really clear of the big problems that we're facing. Many of these get put under this rubric of the Anthropocene and the, the sort of new human behaviors that are going to be required if we are to survive and we are to prevent our extinction going forward.